So intrusion detection. How to detect intruders, intruders into our network. Okay, you think of your home, an intruder is someone who breaks into your home and steals some things or does something bad in, in your home. Uh, how do you detect them? How do you prevent them? Well, now we're dealing with a computer system, the same thing. We want to detect and prevent intruders from getting access to our computer system. We're focusing on intrusion detection. We will not go into much detail about in intrusion prevention. There are some subtle differences and there are some specific software systems that will support these. First, assume attacks will occur. Don't be naive and think you build your computer system and no one's going to attack it. So you need to approach security assuming that someone's going to attack your system. So successful attacks will allow someone to get access, unauthorized access to your system resources. So sometimes we want to prevent attacks, or all the times we'd like to prevent attacks. Okay. But sometimes it's too costly to prevent all attacks. Therefore we make a trade-off and say, okay, if we cannot prevent them, then at least we should be able to detect them if they happen. Okay, so, so the ideal world would be I build my computer system and I build some, some security features such that I prevent all attacks. I set the access control, the permissions correctly, I set a firewall, I use secure software, and I build the system so that no attacks can happen. I prevent all attacks. Unfortunately, in complex systems, that's very hard to do. It's hard to, in a manageable cost, build a truly secure system. Therefore, that is, it's cheaper to pre prevent some attacks and detect the rest. So we're going to focus on detection of attacks. How to prevent attacks? Well, we've seen access control already. How to prevent someone getting unauthorized access? Set up the access control on the files correctly. Set up user authentication so we authenticate the correct user. Next topic, firewalls and other topics on software and web security will look at ways to prevent attacks. But assuming we can't prevent all attacks, we want to be able to detect if an attack does happen. That's what an intrusion detection system, IDS, does. It monitors and analyzes events within the computer system. So when things happen in the system, an IDS monitors, analyzes, to try and find, to log, to keep track of, and warn about intrusions. So when some intrusion takes place, we want to know about it. Once we know about an intrusion, we can take other measures. Maybe we can take technical measures. We can improve our system. If we know someone can intrude through this hole, then we can block that hole in the future. So they can't do it in the future. Or we can find out who did it and take legal measures. Get some financial reimbursement or, or, or some penalty on the attacker. So, who are the intruders? Some, some different terminology here, uh, but the first two, the main two types, outsiders and insiders. We will distinguish between intruders who are normally outside of the computer system and those that have authorized access to the system. The words, and these come from the, the textbook, a masquerader is an outsider. Someone who's, they're not normally authorized to access the system. But somehow they penetrate the authentication or the access control systems and get access as a normal user's account. That is, someone out on the internet logs into the Moodle website using my login. They're an outsider getting access to our system. Miss Fisa, okay, an insider. 
some normal user who accesses resources on the system that they shouldn't access. So a student who, access, who has an account in Moodle can somehow get access to resources that they shouldn't get access to. So a student, for example, can escalate their privileges to become an administrator in Moodle so that they can change the quizzes or change their scores in Moodle. So they're an, a legit, legitimate user, they're a normal user, but they do something bad. So an insider. They misuse their privileges that they normally have. A clandestine user is someone, either insider or outsider, who takes some control of the system or gets some extra privileges and tries to evade detection, okay, tries to hide. What are some examples and just several types of intrusion? What can an intruder do? Okay, they can get access to some server, for example, so get some root access. Once you have root access or administrator access to the server, you can do anything you like on it, usually. Deface a website, so you can get access to the system and put something on the website that makes the organization look bad, for example. Try and guess passwords, so a user maybe an inside user, if they can get access to the database of passwords then they can try and obtain information of other users, their passwords. Or they can try and guess passwords. Copy private information, okay so just some different examples, view sensitive information, financial information, medical information, if you can get access to a system. Uh, again get passwords, and then use this information to do further attacks on the system. Use resources in, in an inappropriate way, so log in or get access to one system, intrude into one system, and then use that system to uh, access some illegal resource or do something illegally from that system. So that when someone traces back, it looks like it comes from the one that the malicious user intruded into. Okay. So I'm sure you can think of examples of that. Pretending to be others, to gain passwords, again back to passwords. Uh, getting access to computers by just going to ones which are unatt un unattended, but logged in. So just some examples. We can often distinguish between different types of intruders and, and what their aims and intentions are. And we may have different uh, responses. So this will look at three types of intruders or three intruder behaviors. And the names may not be the best but a cracker, a criminal enterprise and an internal threat. So the first two are external and the third one is from someone internal, an insider. What's a cracker? Uh, maybe other names you hear of as a uh, what a hacker sometimes is used but someone who is trying to get access to the system to intrude why are they doing it well for the thrill of doing it for the recognition of being able to do it for the status they may not get any financial gain from doing the intrusion okay. but they may get recognition from their peers from other people and, and people say yeah okay you're good because you can intrude into this secure system. So there are such intruders that will do it not so much for financial gain but for their own recognition. Not always the case but usually they're looking for easy targets in this case. And they may share information with others about those targets. So someone who wants to intrude into the SIT system may first communicate with others potential intruders and see what they've learned about the SIT system to try and make their task easier. And they'll usually use flaws in software to gain access. So bugs in software take advantage of those bugs to try and get some access to the uh, unauthorized system. 
Intrusion detection systems are useful for such intruders because we'll see how they work, that they can uh, detect, I won't say simple attacks, but attacks by people who often are not motivated by financial rewards. They may not be as complex as the next type of attacks. So intrusion detection are usually quite useful in these cases. IPS is intrusion prevention systems, which are systems specifically built to try and not just detect, but to, to stop attacks. We will not cover them in any detail, but there's a, another chapter in the textbook that looks at IPS. Other types of intruders are usually those that, who get some financial reward from intruding. They'll get some confidential information and sell that to someone else. Or they'll get some uh, commercial advantage for their business. Or maybe some uh, political or, or um, religious reasons they want to perform an intrusion. They're often more motivated than the crackers. They have more uh, to gain from it. And in many cases they are more organized. So they may not just be individuals or a, a, a small group of individuals, they may be companies, governments or organizations funded by governments or, or criminal gangs or uh, criminal organizations. So usually that we separate these as being larger organizations with more, more, more to gain from an intrusion. Often they are looking for specific targets. A cracker, we say, looking for open targets, looking for any target that they can intrude into. It doesn't matter who it is, they just want to get status that they can intrude. Whereas in this case, they'll be looking at specific targets that they can get the most reward from. And often they don't want to be known that they've done the intrusion. They want to avoid publicity, whereas a cracker may want to advertise the fact, yes, I could intrude into this one to get that extra recognition. Again, use flaws in software to do the intrusion, but often we'll also use social engineering. Okay, so you want to get access into some company, then maybe call up some people in that company pretending to be someone else and try and get information from them that will make the intrusion easier. Okay. Again, intrusion detection systems, useful, and so are intrusion prevention systems. But why do we say useful here and very useful? Maybe we can distinguish that the first set of intruders, the attacks may not be as advanced when you compare it to companies, governments that are doing the attack. And therefore, the more advanced attacks are harder to detect and harder to prevent. The third type are internal users, internal threats. An employee, or maybe even an ex-employee who's just been fired, wants to take some re revenge on people or an organization, or they think they're entitled to do something. So they already have access to the system. So they are internal users, or they recently were internal users. Therefore, very difficult to detect. So they already have authorized access to the system. How do you detect they've been able to use the system? Intrusion detection systems are not as useful for these types of attacks. Okay? IDS is mainly for attacks from outsiders. To stop internal users, there are different mechanisms to use. Uh, least privilege, remember this concept that those users only get access to things that they need to do their job. So don't give them access to the entire system just because they're an internal user. Good authentication so that they can only log in as themselves, even if they know about others. Uh, keeping track of what happens, logging and auditing. Logging is keeping records of all the things that happen on the computer system. So that you, after the fact you can go back and see what happened. Who logged in at this time? What did they do? What commands did they run? What files did they access? And auditing is the process of then uh, analyzing those logs. So you don't just keep the logs, you need to go back and check the logs. 
if you fire someone, make sure you have a policy to uh, make sure that once they've officially left the position that they cannot do uh, damage. Or even before they leave their position, reduce their privileges. So that as, as soon as you terminate someone's employment, make sure that the computer system is updated to indicate that this person is going to, uh, is, has been notified that they're going to lose their job in two weeks time. Therefore, let's reduce their privileges just in case they try to take revenge before they are uh, removed. So, so let's say that the user was had admin privileges. Okay, um, if if we're talking about terminating the employee, that is firing them. Okay, for some reason they you know, they're moving on to another job. Then again, the similar principle of making sure that uh, once that's known that they're going to be terminated, then change their privileges. And with admins in large networks, again, an, an admin user doesn't need to be able to have access to all information systems. Usually just the system that they need for their job. So least privilege becomes important here. Okay. So an admin, I'm the admin on the Moodle server. Doesn't mean I get access to the entire registration system. Okay. I just need the privileges to do it on the, the Moodle server. So I think you can use similar concepts. How does someone intrude? How does someone gain access to an unauthorized system as an external or an outsider? They want to gain access to the system. Or if they're insider, increase their privileges. That is, you're a normal user, but set your privileges so that you can do anything that an admin user can do. Well, one common way is to exploit flaws in software. Bugs in software are a common form for intrusions. We'll see some examples in later topics. We'll look about a little bit about software security, but more about web security as an example of that in its normal operation with some bugs or some poorly implemented mechanisms that software will allow some external user to execute some code to perform some things that were unexpected so if the bug in some software on our computer system allows an intruder to execute the code that they want to be executed then they use that to execute some code to for example set up an account for them or to change the password for someone, or to change the privileges for a particular user. So many attacks take advantage of the fact that the software that the system is using has bugs in it. How do we fix that? Make sure bugs don't exist. Well, that's not possible in software development. Make sure the software we're using is up to date and as few bugs as possible is the main thing. So, to prevent attackers from being able to use software flaws, make sure the software you're using has as few flaws as, as possible. And there are, there are websites, databases that keep track of many known flaws in software, vulnerabilities. Uh, I'll show you some examples in a moment. So, that an organization should keep should monitor the vul vulnerabilities in the software and systems that they are using. For example, we use Moodle as a piece of software that, that runs the website. Okay? That is, um, think of Moodle as a piece of software. It goes, it's updated every uh, few weeks. Okay? So there are many different versions of Moodle. So what we should do is, what I should do as the administrator is keep track of I'm using version 2.5. Have there been any advertised or known bugs in version 2.5? Where would I look? Well, there are usually dedicated websites which keep track of these vulnerabilities, the bugs. 
in different pieces of software. So I could keep from a mailing list and get an automated email saying, Moodle 2.5 has a bug, you should now upgrade to 2.5.1. and perform those updates and do it on a regular basis. On the course website there's a link to some further links about security. You can browse through and one I've listed just some examples of organizations or websites that provide alerts. So they keep track of attacks and bugs and keep a list and you can get an alert when that happens. So there's a list of them here. Uh, there's a national vulnerability database from the US which just has a database of essentially bugs in known software. Similar, a database of common vulnerabilities and exposures from a security perspective. And different mailing lists and forums and so on that people post announcements of known bugs and known attacks. Bug track, full disclosure at examples. Uh, we have an example, the US CERT. CERT is a more general computer emergency response team, more computer emergency readiness team, but it's a common acronym that refers to organizations that uh, keep track of uh, security incidents and try and alert others about it. So usually each country may have their own CERT. So there is Thai CERT, okay, which tries to inform organizations inside the country about different attacks. So US CERT is an example. So they have a website and I think you can follow through and get different alerts that they announce. So on their front page, Apple releases iTunes. Apple has released a security update. Okay. So it's, it's related to the software has been updated because they found some flaws in the software, some security flaws. Cisco releases multiple security advisories advising people that their software and hardware may have vulnerabilities. Okay. And there are other sites that do similar things. What's another one? Security Focus. Again, here's a mailing list. Sorry, hard to see. You have a look in your own time. Just a mailing list where people post security announcements. This software, Graphviz, has a bug and there's been a recent update, for example. Uh, vulnerabilities in some software. So there are many such lists. If you're running a system, you should keep up to date with the vulnerabilities of the system that you're running. All right. Let's keep moving on. Yep. How about if uh, that, that software are enterprise software and normally they, they have the time to have do a test before uh, update in the client? How often do uh, so for, for this to So what we just looked at as examples is that these announcements of the vulnerabilities are made once they're known. So I think you're about asking a question about, okay, when are they known? Uh, so in some enterprise software or some, some software, um, they may not be known. If, if the bugs are not known, then you cannot learn about it. So that's still a flaw or a vulnerability. Um, uh, is that a part uh, of your question? I mean, if the, the, the bug is known already, but... Mm. Uh, the client cannot update right now because they have to have test before. They okay. Yes. Uh, uh, in, in the time yep. of the testing, how we right. So let's say again, I have Moodle and I'm using 2.5 version 2.5, and there's an announcement: version 2.5 has a bug in it. Upgrade to 2.5.1. I don't necessarily go to the server and upgrade immediately because the upgrade may cause other consequences. So the upgrade of a software doesn't necessarily mean the software will work with the existing system. So I need to do some testing and make sure that version 2.6 still works for what I need it to do. For example, all the plugins work, all the extra features that I've developed still work. So 
just because an announcement has been made, it doesn't mean you immediately upgrade, but the time you take to upgrade is this time that the vulnerability still exists in your system. How do you deal with that? Reduce the time to upgrade, so have some way to automate the testing. Uh, maybe you could temporarily block access to the system during the before the upgrade takes place, if it's a very important system. But yes, upgrading takes time. So therefore, from when you learn about the bug until you've fixed it, there's still this window of opportunity for an attack. There's no way around that. That's about software. Fix the bugs. Make sure you have a few bugs as possible. The other is about protected information. So an intruder finds some uh, passwords, for example, and uses that. So they guess passwords or they, uh, from some hashed passwords, they crack passwords and then use that to get access to the system. Or social engineering attacks. We mentioned that, okay, someone pretends to be me. They call up the SIT staff saying, I'm, uh, I'm Steve Gordon's brother. I need some information about him. Um, and the staff believe who, they, who he is, but he's actually an intruder who's trying to find that information about me and will use that information to maybe log in as me. So social engineering attacks. How do you stop that? Make sure you have technologies to protect that information. And for the social engineering especially, it, uh, policies and, and people are aware that confidential information should remain confidential. Okay? That if someone calls up on the phone saying, oh, can you please reset the password for Steve to be ABC? then the person who answers the phone should be aware, uh, well, no, I'm not going to... First, I A, need confirmation as to who you are, and B, maybe say, OK, well, come, come into the computer centre and we'll do it for you there. So we need to make people aware that we need to be careful uh, with the confidential information, especially to stop social engineering attacks. Intrusion detection. So that's about intruders. How do we detect intruders? The general concepts. We can distinguish between host-based intrusion detection or intrusion detection systems, an extension of host-based on multiple computers and collecting multiple information, so distributed host-based and network-based. So we'll go through the three of them. Host-based think of we have some special software on a computer that tries to detect intruders. It monitors what's happening on that computer with the aim of detecting is someone trying to intrude or not. Distributed host base, okay, now we have this intrusion detection software on many computers which are trying to monitor what's happening and they report back to some other central computer to improve the chance of detecting an intrusion. Network-based is not monitoring what happens on computers, but monitors what's sent across a network. So host-based, monitor the activities on a computer. Network-based, monitor the packets being sent through a network. And from that monitoring, trying to determine if some suspicious activity is taking place. All of them use some sensors to collect data. Okay, so the monitoring involves collecting data of what's happening. Data includes collecting packets. You know how to collect packets. TCP dump, Wireshark collects packets. Those concepts can, can be used. Log files. Many software applications keep a log of what the software is doing. It records to a file or a set of files the events that, that, that have taken place with respect to that software. So a web server, for example, whenever, an, when any, whenever anyone accesses a web server, that web server writes a line to a log file saying, who accessed that page? 
I'll show you an example later. So any software can keep a log of what's happening. System call traces, so that's with respect to the operating system. A log of the different calls to the operating system. So calls to functions from different applications. So a function to read the password file or a function to, to open a file or write to a file can be every application that calls that function that's provided by the operating system, the operating system can keep a log of which application called it at what time. So some trace of the system. So sensors collect data. Then we need to analyze the data. Okay, we need to get some information from it. So analyzers receive the collected data and do some analysis on it and they try and determine if an intrusion has taken place. And we also usually need some way for a human to interact, to interact with the data, the results. So some user interface so that an administrator can view the results of the analysis and can control how the intrusion detection system works. Uh, I thought I had a better picture. Right? Later we'll, later we'll see a picture that shows those different entities. How do we detect intruders? So we monitor what happens on a computer system or in a network and we try and detect is an intruder doing something or is it a normal user doing something? So the principles is that we work on the assumption that an intruder behaves different than a normal user, a legitimate user. They do something different from a normal user. So what this diagram shows is it's trying to capture the behavior. So this is the behavior of a normal user. And if this is the behavior of an intruder, if we can determine that behavior somehow, and we'll see ways to do that, then what we want to do in terms of the monitoring and analysis then is to okay, monitor the behavior, what's happening, and then if the behavior of what's currently happening matches that of the intruder, then we classify this as being an intrusion. But if it looks like normal behavior, then don't classify it as an intrusion. So the idea is to be first to be able to distinguish between what an intruder does versus what a normal user does. If we cannot distinguish, then we cannot detect intrusions. So we must be able to distinguish that an intruder does something different than a normal user. So, for example, in this diagram, the concept, if these, if the profile of the intruder, so the behavior of the, the intruder, overlapped fully with the profile of the authorized user, then there would be no way to detect intrusions. So the assumption is that they don't overlap, or they don't fully overlap. There may be some partial overlap. That is, the things that the intruder does sometimes are the same as what a normal user does. That's this solid green part here. So this is indicating the behavior of the intruder and the normal user overlap. So when we detect such behavior, we don't know if it's an intruder or a normal user. But if we detect behavior in this area, which matches only the behavior that an intruder would take, then our intrusion detection system knows that this is an intruder. Similar, if we detect behavior in this area, we measure some behavior in the system which corresponds with what a normal user would normally do, then we assume it's not an intrusion. Now this is all, uh, well this is the principle. It's hard to get these profiles of the behavior. What does a normal user do? What does an intruder do? That's the challenge here. So an intrusion detection system should return some results. So some, some things happen in the system. It should return, is this intrusion or not? We may get false positives. 
a normal user is identified as an intruder. So if the system doesn't work perfectly, then the normal user may be doing something, but the intrusion detection system identifies that as an intruder. That's a po false positive. We don't want that to happen. We want to minimize the false positives. Another thing we don't want to happen is false negatives. We're measuring what the system is doing, and it's actually an intruder doing something on our computer system, but our intrusion detection system doesn't detect that. It thinks it's a no normal user. So the intruder goes unidentified. The intrusion is not detected. So we want to minimize the false positives, but also minimize the false negatives. And they conflict in some ways. Let's look at some details. And in the last 10 minutes, let's come back to the requirements next lecture. Let's look at uh, a host-based intrusion detection system. Uh, just skipping through, I want to... Okay, we'll get there. So a host-based intrusion de detection system, assume there's some special software on your computer, the host. Its goal, detect intruders. What it does is it monitors what's happening on your computer and uses some algorithm to determine is this, are these actions the result of an intrusion or not? So some special software on your computer to do this, to detect intrusions and to inform people if, if something looks like an intrusion, send an alert. And maybe you can even stop attacks if the attack is detected or the intrusion is detected early. Let's look at how to do that. Anomaly detection is we measure or observe the behavior, what's happening on the computer system, and compare it against previous records of the behavior. So, say with the ICT server, I record over a period of a month of when students log in, how often they log in to the ICT server, how often they access Moodle, uh, at what times of the day that they access, how long they logged in for. I record that for the normal users. Okay, so I have some knowledge of what the normal users do with that computer, the normal behavior. And now I start my intrusion detection system, which has that knowledge of the normal users, and now it monitors what's happening right now and compares it against the past behavior. And with that, if the current behavior crosses some threshold, that is, the number of attempts to log in exceeds some threshold compared to what I've measured in the past, then maybe that's an indicator of an intrusion. So before we go through the other parts, let's go to, I want to get to the examples. Just to give you an idea of how do we measure the behavior. And it's maybe hard to see, but in front of you, some different examples of, okay, one is about monitoring logins. And when someone logs into a system, what they do and how long they do things for. So the measure may be how frequently someone logs in by, di by day or time. So with the idea that intruders are more likely to, or maybe more likely to log in in off hours, that is late at night as opposed to during the day. The idea is that if we know how often people log in, and I know from the ICT server that students only log in during labs. The only time they use Moodle is during the lab, which is Monday 9 to 4 and Friday 1 to 12. If I know that, and then I monitor someone's logging in on Saturday at 11 p.m., that may be an indicator that that behavior is outside the profile of the normal user and therefore detect an intrusion. Now it's not that simple 
or it doesn't. It may not be that effective if we keep it that simple, but then we can use other information. So, where did they log in from? Okay, I think you may experience this with email systems. You log into Gmail, and if you've logged in from a different country than you normally log in, Gmail may present some warning or even require some other authentication. Because it, what it's doing is it's recording, or it knows your normal behavior. You normally log in from this location. But then one day later, there's a login attempt from another country to your account. Well, that raises a, a trigger. Something may be going wrong. This may be an intrusion. Okay? So login location may be used. Not just on country, but based upon IP addresses as well. Time since login, so maybe an intruder tries to break into accounts which are no longer used. Okay, so the old students from SIT from three or four years ago who had accounts on, uh, in SIT but no longer or are no longer active, but then we suddenly see a, and a login attempt for that account, then that may be an indicator of an intrusion. Uh, so sessions refers to how long you're logged in for. Okay, so we can use the statistics of the average time that you stay logged in for and between sessions and use that to indicate if something <coughs> looks not normal then that may be an intrusion. Uh, amount of output to a location. Okay, a normal login involves copying one file from the server to your home computer. But then there's a login that results in the copying of thousands of files, gigabytes of data from the server to some computer. Maybe that's abnormal and indicates a possible intrusion. Maybe the intruder is copying or downloading as many details as possible from the server. Utilization of the, the resources on the computer, the CPU, the, the disk activity, again. If we have a profile of normal CPU activity from the normal users, then something outside of that we can detect as an intrusion. Failed pass passwords. Uh, and failed logins related to that. So failure attempts to log in may be an indicator of an intrusion. Uh, all right, we'll go through the others. I don't have time to give an example today. Thursday we'll give some examples of these on a real system. Execution of programs on the computer system. Ex execution of software. So on the system they execute commands. Normally the normal user uh, executes commands to list their contents of their directory, to change directories. So that's the normal behavior. But then someone logs in and starts to run sudo uh, rm uh, star trying to delete all the files as the sudo user when they don't have access. Or maybe that's an indicator of a potential intrusion. Someone has intruded and is trying to get admin rights. So they're executing programs and that execution gives us an indicator that that's not normal. Uh, file access is the other way. Okay. Normally users access files according to certain patterns. But if someone tries to access files outside those patterns, that can be used to detect an intrusion. So if someone tries to read uh, normally confidential files, again that may be a detector. Or the rate at which they read files or that they delete files. Normally a user may only delete files in their own account uh, on, at some rate. But if someone tries to delete as many files as possible, as fast as possible, that may be an indicator of an intruder. So these are just examples of how can we measure system, computer systems, what can we measure, and how can we use that to indicate that this behavior is different from the normal behavior and therefore classify it as an intrusion.
we'll go back on Thursday and look at these different ways of anomaly detection and signature detection and go through host-based and distributed host-based in a bit more detail. And I'll show some examples of uh, some of those measures, say on the ICT server and on other computer systems. Let's stop there. Uh,